Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, secret land purchases near an air base in California are buyers strong-arming farmland owners. Plus, a modification by the EPA of the WOTUS rule also raising eyebrows. In our feature, a lifelong 4-H'er in Mississippi carrying on his family's legacy. And food banks say it's about fairness, using AI to decide who gets food and how much. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. As always, good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Over the last few years especially, we've heard much about foreign ownership of American farmland and how a good deal of that ownership is centered around American military bases. Reporter Marley Ginter reports on secret purchases in California. California lawmakers taking a close look at the secretive plan purchases near Travis Air Force Base in Solano County. Phones at my office have been ringing off the hook. State Senator Bill Dodd represents communities around the air base. It is job one to protect the land around there from encroachment. A group known as Flannery Associates has bought up more than 50,000 acres of farmland nearby. Flannery Associates is now surrounded three sides, 75 percent. Now news reports have unveiled some of the group's wealthy investors. The names are very prominent names in Silicon Valley. They include venture capital billionaires and even the widow of Apple co-founder Steve Jobs. Flannery and Associates is using secrecy, bullying and mobster tactics to force generational farm families to sell. That's prompting lawmakers to consider new efforts to prevent these types of anonymous land grabs. What happens if a hostile actor purchases the land and we don't know what they want to use that land for? So what are the proposals being considered to protect farmland? Ideas include more disclosure of ag land purchases, prohibiting foreign ownership of farms, and new tax credits and conservation easements to help growers. This will help keep agricultural land in production while preserving the rural ag economy. A survey indicates Flannery is considering a futuristic new city on the farmland, but others say that threatens the future of the air base. Travis Air Force Base cannot operate surrounded by skyscrapers, wind turbines, tracked homes, right up to the fence line. No military base can. By some estimates, Flannery Associates, mentioned in the story you just watched, has purchased nearly $1 billion of farmland in Solano County alone. The firm says its California Forever Development Project is committed to supporting Travis Air Force Base and the surrounding community. Some area residents are skeptical. In related news, the state of Mississippi, concerned about foreign ownership, recently held the first meeting of its new group known as the Study Committee on Foreign Purchases of Farmland in Mississippi. Like other states and after such ownership has become much more scrutinized, Mississippi leaders created the committee through legislative action last month. The nine-member group will analyze land purchases and other interests in ag land by foreign governments. In a statement, Mississippi Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson said, quote, we have found that some 757,000 acres, over 2% of Mississippi's agricultural land, is controlled by foreign interests. As the study committee further explores the issue of foreign purchases of farmland, we will consider a number of factors, including national security, food security, landowners and property rights, and international trade. The study committee looks forward to submitting a report of findings to the legislature by December 1st. In other news, a topic we've reported on frequently over the last six years, the Waters of the United States, WOTUS. In May, the Supreme Court limited the reach of government in its Sackett versus EPA ruling. But now, yet another revision that adds to a mountain of revisions. Farm Week's Jonah Holland is in studio with more. Jonah? Thanks, Zach. And yes, the Supreme Court may be out of session, but its rulings are still in season and the ramifications are being navigated. Recently, the EPA again released rules for its latest draft of WOTUS and one word becomes key in the new direction set forth. Navigable. Peter Tubbs explains why. 
unpermitted development will be allowed in many wetland areas across the country under details released by the Environmental Protection Agency this week. The new rule revises the Biden administration's Waters of the U.S., or WOTUS definition, which was struck down by the Supreme Court in May in Sackett versus EPA. The previous rule had expanded Clean Water Act protections to wetlands and waterways. The new rule removes the significant nexus standard, which allowed protection to wetlands if there was a connection between a wetland and a waterway that allowed water to flow between the bodies of water. The new language states wetlands protected by the Clean Water Act must have a continuous surface connection to a navigable waterway in accordance with the Sackett ruling. Proponents of limiting the reach of the Clean Water Act believe that the federal law doesn't properly respect the rights of property owners. Conservationists argue that the new rule will leave thousands of wetlands across the country vulnerable to pollution and removal without penalty. While many wetlands will no longer be under the scope of the Clean Water Act, they may still be protected by state rules. So, with the seemingly constant revisions of WOTUS, time will tell if the latest revision has any kind of legal staying power. Zach? Thanks, Jonah. It's been a legislative tug of war. On one side, property owners who want to control their own land and prevent government overreach, and environmental groups seeking to expand what they see as navigable waters. Time will tell, indeed. Another topic we've heard much about lately, AI, artificial intelligence. Now we hear about how AI may be used at food banks to distribute food in what organizers say would be more about fairness. David Miller has more. The problem of food insecurity may have another ally, artificial intelligence. So in these problems, these are matching problems. You're trying to match a donor with a recipient, right? So uh, there's many things you can think of this way. Once the issue of efficiency is solved, then the problem of fairness and distribution comes into play. AI could also assist in making sure food is used and not wasted due to logistical constraints. The current system is uh, a person is making these matching decisions and we just want to automate it. And in doing so, we want to ensure that we're doing the right decisions, like in the sense of like, people are not driving a lot, the food is going to people who want the food and can use the food, but also at the same time, we are being fair. The technology could further be employed to make connections between the locations and amounts of surplus food by helping to choose where the food is needed the most. Uh, the other thing is now you can scale. Now you can just like, you know, go beyond Indiana. You can, you can, you know, include more food banks. You can, you know, include uh, process donations a lot faster because a human doesn't have to sit around trying to call people on the phone and, and so on. One of each. According to the Food Bank News, the 300 largest food banks in the nation distributed nearly $19 billion of food last year, an increase of 37 percent. That compared to SNAP benefits of $108 billion in 2021. On the lighter side, a moss garden can be a different way to beautify your landscape. This week in Southern Gardening, Eddie Smith is in South Mississippi for a whimsical visit to one such garden. Here's Eddie. A moss garden can make a great place to relax and cool off from this summer heat. Today, Southern Gardening is at the home of Jack and Nadine in Petal, Mississippi, sharing with you their enchanting moss garden. As you enter the moss garden, you are greeted with a cute moss garden sign and one of the many ant sculptures located throughout the gardens. The ant sculptures add a whimsical feel to the moss garden area. The dense green moss covering the ground looks like a thick green carpet. Umbrella palms around the garden add to the enchanted atmosphere. The bracts of the umbrella palms, sometimes referred to as leaves, resemble the spokes of an umbrella. Begonias and impatience add a pop of color to the garden. A rustic and unique swing provides the perfect place to sit, relax, and enjoy the beautiful garden. Right now, Mother Nature has provided bright yellow-orange colored mushrooms popping up through the moss. They definitely catch your eye with their bright color. An old fabric rug 
covered in moss defines a nice seating area to unwind and enjoy a refreshing beverage. A variegated cast iron plant in a beautiful ceramic pot is at the entrance to the seating area. Its dark green leaves with yellowish white speckles really stand out. The pink begonias in colorful ceramic pots also brighten up the seating area. Consider adding a moss garden to a shady area of your landscape. It will provide a great place to relax and cool off from the summer heat. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a special episode of Extension Matters. It's a family affair. We meet Jacob Turner, a lifelong 4-H'er in Greenville, Mississippi, who's carrying on his family's 4-H legacy. He shares all about the opportunities this youth organization can provide while teaching students valuable life skills and how to make the best better. Learn how he's making an impact on his community and demonstrating just how much extension matters. That's coming up. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Gray is still falling in price. Will it continue? That's a good question. Based on what we know, it looks like they've hit rock bottom or close to it. Well, we'll get into that and more. But first, the numbers. We'll take a look at this week's biggest gains and losses. And then in our row report, we see what the experts have to say about the grain markets. And finally, a look into what's moving the livestock markets. So, markets closed last week pretty mixed. Row crops mostly down, while livestock both. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, lean hogs up nearly three and a half cents, about a four and a quarter percent rise from the previous week. Reasons have to do with an increase in demand. Last week's biggest loss, wheat down 26 and a quarter cents, a near four and a quarter percent decrease from the previous week. We'll get into the reasons why right now. So, in this week's row report, we talk about the falling price of grains, specifically wheat and corn. Wheat prices slipping downward recently despite the international situation, and you'd think that would mean they would rise. However, according to analyst John Roach, Russia and Ukraine are getting their wheat out, albeit slowly, and at a discount, which makes the world price go down. 
We've had a buy signal on wheat. I think we're up to 18 days now. So, I mean, we've already gone down into the technical support area where the market should uh, find buyers. But, but what we're finding instead is speculative funds willing to sell and very few over on the buy side really willing to buy very much. Uh, keep in mind that what we have going on in Ukraine and Russia, the, the, the biggest exporters of the world are right now uh, really having a difficult time being able to make any exports. Uh, Russia is restricted by uh, most all of the peace-loving nations and uh, Ukraine has shipping problems. So if anybody buys from Russia or Ukraine, they're buying at a discount. And that's holding the whole world price level at a discount, in my opinion. And, and my hope is that, that, that we get past that. But at the moment, we don't have that run on the horizon at all. We may well see some people shift back away from wheat. We had some, some, some movement back into wheat this year. We could maybe see it move back out a little bit. Uh, we certainly did better in, in, uh, uh, in the uh, hard red winter wheat area with some of the corn plantings than we did with the wheat. And so uh, there's sure a, sure a possibility of that. Uh, but uh, uh, at the moment, um, uh, I, I wouldn't look for any real big change in acreage. The corn market is a, has another couple things going on. First of all, the open interest is not as big as normal. And so with a smaller open interest, uh, you have to look at the players and the, and the users are not anxious to go out and buy a, a substantial amount of inventory until we get into harvest and, and, and they see a crop that's coming on and so they're, they're reluctant to buy. Farmers are in a position where they really don't want to sell anything. Uh, and those who've bought have already been stung with margin calls enough that they're, they're not really coming in. And so the spec funds, even though they're not trading in huge volumes, it's enough to just put pressure on the market and hold it under pressure. And it's going to continue that way until the trend turns higher. Now, you ask about wheat. Are we making a bottom in wheat? I think we are making the bottom in corn. Uh, we had the Farm Progress Show in Illinois this week, and uh, we've made the bottom uh, several times during that time frame because that's when the August 31st deferred pricing contracts or delayed pricing contracts, many of them got priced through this week uh, because they came to their deadlines. And so that's about as big of a, of a whoosh of of inventory moving into the market that you're going to have until we finally get into harvest. And harvest is still a couple of weeks away. So I think corn market's bottoming here. And if you're, if you're a corn producer, now's not a time to sell. You've, already, you've got crop insurance that you're protected. If it goes on down, your crop insurance will protect you. If it goes up, your crop insurance will shrink, but you'll end up basically the same number of dollars. If you sell your crop and then the price goes up uh, and then your insurance payment is less and, and you, it doesn't cover. So your, your only thing you can do right now if you're a farmer with corn is be patient and wait a little bit. Moving on to livestock, big news going on is that cattle prices seem to have hit their peak for now. Meanwhile, hog prices rising based on an increase in demand as pork competes with beef. John Roach says we're in a kind of holding pattern while the rest of the economy sorts itself out. We don't think really that the market's ready to fall apart. We, I can't point that to things in the cattle market, the cash market, that are so frightening that, that, uh, that I think we're ready to give up and start to go down. Um, but uh, we certainly have a difficult time moving much higher. I mean, we're in a sideways kind of a pattern here, and, um, and we're at very high price levels. And this could sure be the top at any time. Um, uh, but we really don't yet have those fundamentals put together. Uh, the cattle are very profitable coming out of the feedlot right now. People aren't holding them any longer. They just move them as quickly as they can get to those profit levels. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that keeps your supply under control. Our economy continues to kind of percolate along, so the high-priced steak restaurants are still full, but that, that could have a change out ahead too, depending on economic conditions. So there's some things out there to be concerned about, but we're not really saying that it's over yet. Uh, be cautious if you're on the buyer buy side of this thing and keep your hedge protection in if you're putting cattle in a feedlot. Hog uh, prices compared to beef prices compared to pork prices, there's too, too great of a variance there. And so we think the demand will, will start to pick back up, particularly if the economy starts to struggle a little bit in here. And remember, we still have a lot of people out there that are on the lower side of the economic uh, scale. And, and beef is out of their budget completely, and, so, and, so, and pork is very competitive. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Been one heck of a weather year in row crops and livestock so far. Looks like prices have gone with it too. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Next up in today's feature, another installment of our popular Extension Matters series. We meet a young man who builds on the 4-H experience of his family over the years. Here, thanks to producer Brian Utley, is a charming story from Washington County, Mississippi. Meet Jacob Turner. 
feel as if 4-H makes you grow as a person, not only as a person, but as a whole community. 4-H can help build leadership skills, life skills, basically any skills that you want to learn that can get you through your daily life. My name is Jacob Turner and I'm from Washington County and I've been 4-H since I was five years old. It all started out with my great-grandmother, Margie Johnson, and once she got in 4-H, the whole family just started coming right behind her. It's just basically been like a legacy. So you're looking at my grand grandmother, um, it's Margie Johnson, and my mom is Mamie Johnson, and I, Monica Turner, and Jacob Turner. And we've all been uh, members of the Fo Willing Workers 4-H Club. 4-H matters to my family because it have, has given my kids skills for leadership, life skills. Um, it has given them confidence in the classroom, outside the classroom. So I am very grateful for 4-H. It's an outlet that they can do, first of all, and they can learn new things. There are so, so, so many areas out there now that if you have an interest, they'll find a way for you to learn. You just have to have that, make the first step, and they'll make the rest. I feel like 4-H is very diverse, honestly, because I feel like if this person or that person didn't want to do that, you can always do this. And, and you never know what a person might like until they actually join 4-H. So I just feel like 4-H just has a wide variety of things for them to do. Jacob Turner, is, I would consider him as a good kid. Uh, some kids, you meet them, they're just loud when they walk in the room and friendly. But Jacob is quiet, and he's going to wait till his turn. And when you talk to him, you, you'll say, this kid's talking beyond his years. He's more, got more wisdom than, I, than you would anticipate. Get unstuck. I see myself growing by just learning how to put yourself out there, learning how to meet new people, learn how to just overall be a better person. And that's what I actually like about 4-H. Even though it seems like you're learning a lot of things, you're also having fun while doing it. And you really don't, don't even know that you just learned a whole bunch of stuff. I know he's grown in his um, being outspoken, because as I told you before, he was very reserved and quiet. Now he's that leader that we need in the county for the, for the younger kids. And, you know, they all run up behind him. It's like the mother duck, the father duck, and the other ones, little ones running behind him. That's how it is. You'll see it tomorrow at the grilling contest. That's how it is. They just follow behind him. He has so much patience and caring for those little ones. Jacob will be going to college in a few years. And one of the first classes that he's going to have to take his speech. So he's already above the rest of the crowd because he already know how to speak in front of a crowd. He don't have to overcome that fear. Uh, like, I think he's going to be a commentator, so I think he's going to be able to speak well in front of people. You know, that's just my faith in him. You're not proud of him, are you? I am very proud of all my grands. I'm very proud of him. Um, the ambassador jacket means a great bit to him and his 4-H agent. You know, that was one of his things when they was coming up and they was young. He's like, we gotta get those green jackets back to Washington County. So, Mr. Hines has got them on the right path to being great leaders and young men and women in the county. The 4-H agents that I work with are great teachers because they always They'll let you do it first, but they'll always be right there just in case you need somebody to fall back on. And if you need someone to just listen, or just need someone to just help you, they're always there. It's, it's the simple uh, motto of 4-H, make the best better. When we see kids, we see the best. Because there's so much, so much potential in that kid to grow. And when they do these projects, then you're making them better and better and better. And they grow. And to see from sitting in the back or just watching to now being a leader in everything that he does uh, is wonderful. As a mom, that means I'm raising a nice young man on the, on the 
right path to being a great citizen to the people in this world. Um, so I'm, a, um, I'm very appreciative of 4-H in, in Mississippi because if it had not been, then he could have been anywhere doing anything. Extension matters to families. You can take a family and kids can do things by themselves, but in the end, they love to do things with their family. So 4-H gives kids the opportunity to do it yourself and say, I did it, and then also gives them opportunity to work with others and build a family, a friendship that they'll, that'll last a lifetime. Young Jacob Turner, a successful 4-H'er and wise beyond his years. Well, next week, a water program that's good for the environment and helps farmers make more money. It's a certification program in Minnesota that incentivizes farmers to protect their most valuable resource, water. Of course, farming is a balancing act, but this program helps farmers optimize their operations in a way that they usually wind up more profitable. And that's a win-win in everyone's book. Farmers taking water quality to the next level. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we go, you have to see this video for yourself to believe it. Police pulled over a driver with an unusual passenger, to say the least. A full-size bull apparently named Howdy Doody. In what turned out to be a routine traffic stop, the driver was questioned by the police and given a written warning. No word on why this particular mode of transportation, but the bull's name was Apropos. After the stop, the bull and his owner were quickly on their way back home. No one was injured. <laughs> Did you see the, the horns on that guy? Yeah, man, that's no bull. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, if you missed the story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.